every generation it always seems there's something new and exciting that people want to cling to or hang on to or somehow make relevant to their own particular generation they want to find their own voice they want to call themselves their own name generation XYZ or the baby boomers or whatever it may be sometimes it's advertising that gives them a name sometimes it's themselves that choose it sometimes it's not beneficial when it comes to realizing that that's not the name that God would have given you had he been consulted for after all he is going to give you a new name and it will be written on a white stone if you're saved but you see there's always those that want to make themselves out to repackage things to their generation even modern times now they want to make things easier to understand let's don't use archaic languages let's make it a modern language let's bebop it hip hop it you know wrap it up you know so that we can wrap it to the rap so cycle you know or we can put it through the spin cycle you know and come out on the other side of political acceptability you know and remove all references to sin because we'll just say yeah you didn't make it you know you weren't good enough well forget about good we'll just say you know you need to get better it's not that you're not good enough it's just you need to get better no sin is sin recently I just saw a presentation by you know some people that you know went to Hollywood you know and sold this idea about repackaging the Bible you know and making it into some kind of big deal so that they could use it for evangelism I personally can't see it as evangelism after having seen one episode because they removed sin out of it. They took Sodom and said, well, you know, they were violent people, so God destroyed them because they weren't, you know, doing God's will. And I said, no, they were sinning, and the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah had reached the heavens, and they went to go and see what had been so bad. And they said bluntly that they wanted to sodomize, you know, the angels. They wanted to have sexual intercourse with these types of beings. And they wanted to, quite frankly, were willing to commit homosexuality with angels. And that was what Sodom is from. Sodomy is from homosexuality. And they removed it completely, took it completely out of it. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And then they kind of reworded the way that Abraham was offering his son, you know, so that it kind of focused in on a little bit of, you know, like what Abraham had to, you know, like put up with from God in order to be tested, but that it wasn't a matter of sin involved or anything else. And so it was kind of interesting the way they picked on things and changed things to repackage it to make it easier to get saved. Go to hell. That's the bottom line. I want to make it harder to get to hell. I want you to realize just what it costs the Son of God in His own death and resurrection to be accepted by a free gift of God through grace for you to make it to heaven. Go to hell. Once you've been there, then you tell me what it's like you know, to give up on salvation that's been freely given to you to go to heaven. Because frankly, you're already going to hell. If you want to get out of that, then you don't need to listen to some prepackaged, reformatted way of dealing with a nice way of saying you need to clean up your act but what God has said you're going to hell for eternity unless you accept what I provided for you that's the bottom line and so I hate when people try to wishy-washy spongebob it you know kinda confuse it abuse it reuse it you know and make it into something it's not that's not Christianity that's Hollywood in action. And I call them Hollywood Christians because what they'll do is they'll say, well, you know, people aren't that bad. Well, according to God, they're all going to hell. And according to God, when he spoke to Moses and was trying to save the children of Israel, God said, hey, look, I've had it. Let me just wipe them all out. Moses negotiated. God was willing to just terminate the existence of the children of Israel, every single one of them, and start over with Moses. Interesting. Be careful what you do when you're messing around with the Word of God, or the Word of God will mess around with you, and He will do something you don't want to know. And if your name is blotted out of the Book of Life, guess what? You have no life. That's the point. The Book of Revelation warns us about those kinds of things. If you try to change things and rearrange things and try to you know, pacify or fruitify or try to make it some kind of I, 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 you're going to wind up with, yes, you are, and guess where you'll be? Because 
You don't get to mess around with the Word of God. You get to let people know, give them freedom of choice, love them so that they'll know that God is love. But the point is, leave them alone. If you want to go to hell, go to hell. That's fine. It's your choice. You know, I don't care. But the point is, you can go to heaven. That's your choice too. If you choose to accept what God has done for you, if you choose to reject it, you will go to hell. No ifs, ands, or buts, and no questions asked. You can go to heaven, but it'll be your determination. Because God has already provided the way that you could avoid hell. Is he really my Lord? So that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus. Acts 20:24. 20, joy comes from seeing the complete fulfillment of the specific purpose for which I was created and born again, not from successfully doing something of my own choosing. Let's think about that for a minute. Joy comes from seeing the complete picture, the complete fulfillment, the complete accomplishment of the specific purpose for which I was created. Why am I here? What is God's purpose for me? Can I know God's will for me? Can I find out what God's purpose is? Can I know why I was created? Yes. And born again, not from successfully doing something of my own choosing. You see, a direction of a man's heart is his own. He can choose any way he wants to go. But the footsteps are ordered of the Lord. Your footsteps may be leading you in a place where you don't want to go. It says a fool in his folly will soon fall into a pit. Well, those footsteps will lead him right into a pit and they'll dive right in. But a wise man will consider his ways and he'll examine them according to the word of the Lord and determine whether or not he's acting in obedience to what God has told him to do or not. Are you? It could be very easy for a Christian to wind up in hell irregardless of what they think they are if they're not checking in with God regularly, daily, consistently. Oh sure, there's such a thing as eternally secure, but you won't know that until you're there secured because you don't know who you are. Only God does. The joy of our Lord experience came from doing what the Father sent Him to do. And he says to us, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Are you doing what Jesus said to do? Have you asked him? Jesus said, ask and you would receive. Seek and you would find, knock and door shall be open. There's no reason not to know what God's will is for you. You ask him and you keep asking him and you keep asking and you ask. If you don't know, you ask again. Until you know what God's will is for you, you are doing his will. You need to ask him and then do it. According to James 1.5, if you lack wisdom, ask God. According to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, if you trust in Him and let Him lead, He will lead you. You don't have to think about it. You just have to ask. It's that simple. It's that direct. It's that personal. Have you received a ministry from the Lord? If so, you must be faithful to it, to consider your life valuable only for the purpose of fulfilling that ministry. Did God call you into ministry? Yes, from the moment you chose to follow Him, you were called into ministry because He said, Go! Go! Teach all nations. Go! Make disciples all nations. Go! Share with my brethren the things that I have said. Teach them. Relate to them. Make disciples of them. You have a ministry. If you have no other ministry that God has called you to, you have the basic ministry God has called every Christian to. And that is to be a witness unto Jesus. And that is to share the gospel. That is to tell people what you've experienced in the gospel. If you haven't experienced it, you're not saved. If you have experienced it, you have a testimony. There you go. Share it. If you didn't, if you have no testimony, you aren't saved. If you have a testimony, you can share it. Because you're saved. Isn't that simple? You don't think so? Yes, it is. If you're saved, you have a testimony. Share how it happened. Share it. That's your testimony. That's the gospel. If you don't, you aren't saved. And you aren't doing God's will. Because God's will is for you to do what He's told you to do. Have you received a ministry from the Lord? If so, you must be faithful to it to consider your life valuable only for the purpose of fulfilling that ministry. Knowing that you have done what Jesus sent you to do, think how satisfying it will be to hear Him say to you, Well done, good and faithful servant. 
Matthew 25, 21. We each find and we each have to find a niche in life. And spiritually, we find it when we receive a ministry from the Lord. That becomes our purpose, our design, our reality. To do this, we must have close fellowship with Jesus and must know him as more than our personal Savior. Oh, it's simple to say, oh, Jesus saved me, you know, thank you, God, you know, and say, I did it in the name of Jesus, in the name of Christ, in the name of this, in the name of that. Well, in the name of is nice, but if you're not talking to God and hearing from him, guess what? <laughs> it's only in name only. Sorry, it's not personal. It's not real. You need to get real. Getting real means you need to start talking to and expecting God to talk to you. You need to shut up long enough to listen. That's the bottom line. If you don't know how, grab a devotional, start reading. It's my point of view. Grab a devotional, start reading. You pick. God will start talking to you one way or another. He'll try to get through if you're willing to ask him to. But most people don't want to hear from God, and that's your point. If you want to get to the place of fulfilling your purpose for life in and of itself that God has created you to be, then you have to follow the rules and regulations that God has called you to, but also you have to know Him in order to follow Him. He has to be heard from in order to know what His will is. Because if you don't, you're fooling yourself. You can make up God's will for your life. That's easy. Religion has done that all along, and Christianity often does that in denominations and discipleship. It tells you lots of things that you can make up from Scripture. But you must know Jesus, because that's what eternal life is, to know the Father and to know Him who sent, me, sent Him. To do this, we must have close fellowship with Jesus and must know Him as more than our personal Savior, and we must be willing to experience the full impact of Acts 9.16 I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. God hasn't called you to a rosy place. He hasn't called you to give you an abundant life in prosperity. He hasn't called you to give you an abundant life in oh boy, I get all money. He's called you to come and take up your cross and follow him. You will suffer. Do you love me? Jesus said. Then feed my sheep. John 21, 17. No, really. Think about it. Do you love him? Do you really? Go to a Sunday school. Do you love him? Teach your children at home. Do you love him? Teach your husband. Do you love him? Teach your wife. Do you love him? Teach your in-laws and your outlaws. Teach your people you know. Do you love him? Feed my sheep. Jesus said it. As much as you've done it to least my brother, you've done it unto me. If you haven't done it, you haven't done it. He is not offering us a choice of how we can serve him. He is asking for absolute loyalty to his commission, a faithfulness to what we discern when we are closest in possible fellowship with God, when we are as tight as we feel like we are right. Have you ever been so tight that you know you're right? Have you ever been so right that you know you're tight? Get there. I don't care whether it's in your worship time, your prayer language, whatever games you play or whatever tallies you wear or however kippas you do or whether you fall flat on your face or whether you lay on the couch watching TV. Whenever you feel closest and most intimate with God, at that moment in time, that should be the time that you know God and you hear from Him what He wants you to do. If you have received a ministry from the Lord, you will know that the need is not the same as the call. The need is the opportunity to exercise the call. Anyone can put up a list of needs, and you could go out and fulfill it and not do what God has told you to do, because you have lots of money to go ahead and throw some money at it. Money, cutting a check and sending a missionary out doesn't cut it. You be the one and go, because you know, quite frankly, if God has told you to go, or if he's told you to stay. But you see, Jesus commands us to go, Keith Green once said, and it should be the exception if you stay, not the predilection of man to determine for himself where he will go and what he will do. You should be as the wind blows. Whither it will, nobody knows where it's coming from, and they sure don't know where it's going. So too, likewise, should be everyone who's led by the Spirit of God, and that's what you should be led by, not by your job, your economy, your marriage, your children, your home, your house, your commitments. They should not be the first priority of what 
the Spirit of God is telling you to do. But you should go and let the Spirit of God lead you in the way that you should go. This does not imply that there is a whole series of differing ministries marked out for you. Oh, well, I'll jump here, there, and everywhere. It does mean that you must be sensitive to what God has called you to do. And this may sometimes require ignoring demands for service in other areas. I have turned down from a pastor, a Calvary Chapel pastor, straight up, said, I want to make you a pastor. I said, no. He says, what do you mean no? I said, no. God has not called me to be a pastor. God has called me to do what I'm doing. When God calls me to be a pastor, I'll be a pastor. But other than that, no. I'm not going to go because you want to make me into a pastor. And he offered me to you know, go to a Bible college, you know, and do this, that, and the other thing. And it was a desire of my heart, yes. Something I'd always wanted to do. It's like, yeah, I'd love to be a pastor, you know. If someone came up to me today and said, Michael, I want you to pray about coming over and visiting our church. And when you're there, I want you to meet the people. And when you meet the people, I want you to think in your heart, you know, what the Lord would have you to do to be with this pe these people and to grow them up into walking with God in a more intimate, personal way. I would say to that person, I'm there, because you see, that's what video does. It's sharing in an sharing in a personal, intimate way, the knowledge of Jesus Christ, knowledge of Jesus in a more intimate, personal way, that they would grow up into knowing Him more intimately even than I do, and that would be a compliment being a pastor of a church to the video ministry that God has called me to. It would complement the two together. They would work hand in hand. They would join together and be one. But you see, that's different than saying, oh, well, I want you to pray about it and then come be your pastor. No, sorry. It's not a I'm automatically there kind of thing. It would have to be something that God has said, I want you to go there. Then I would go, even after God told me to go there, I would have to meet with the people and share with them from my heart to theirs. To be committed to a person in a pastorage is to be caring for the flock and the sheep in such a way that you want to develop them into knowing for themselves Jesus in a personal, intimate way. And not to just simply be standing in a pulpit preaching the Word of God because you're preaching. No. I want to sit with people in a home and coalesce together and coalition among us the Holy Spirit so that together we would all grow up into the fullness of the body of Christ that God has called us to be. And if that's in an individual body somewhere in a small setting, I would be thrilled. If it was in a major setting, I'd have to pray about it. <laughs> so, all you mega churches, you know, think twice before you invite me. <laughs> you never know what come out of my mouth. The Holy Spirit leads. You know, people I've wondered sometimes, you know, because I'm in the ministry, you know, and I've been in the ministry for a long time, but I'm always dumbfounded by some of the ministry that different people do. You know, some people spend a whole week, you know, they, they have this week-long thing of, you know, like, I guess they, they have a sermon, they got their outline, they got their, you know, little thing, they do their homework, you know, and then they do their little Bible study, and they do their little thing, you know, and they got it all together, you know. And then when it comes up to the day that they're going to, you know, teach on Sunday morning, it's all laid out, you know, and they blah, 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 and do their thing. I never figured that one out yet. Because I don't do that in video. I never have. I've never done that in Bible studies. I never have. You know, during my normal Bible studies, I may learn something, you know, and I'll make that a part of my life, and then it's always a part of my life, so that I'll bring it up and out, you know, when it comes time, you know, if I'm going to share it from wherever the Word of God is at that point in time that I'm teaching it, that it'll come out from the Holy Spirit, inspire me, the words that He wants me to say, rather than the words that I want to say, because I could outline it, but guess what? God will never do that with me, because He's always said that don't think about what you're going to say ahead of time, because I'll give you the words that you're supposed to say at the time that you need to say it, because I'm going to bring you before magistrates and before elders and deacons and all these other people, so that you can speak the Word of the Lord and that the Word of man, so that you'll be inspired by God and not by yourself. <sighs> yeah! <laughs> now that's a ministry, amen? <laughs> I mean, really. That's me. That's how God uses me, you know. In my normal life, you know, if I came up to a Sunday, I'd be sharing whatever it is I learned that day, you know, inspired by the Lord. She's sharing. And so, I don't get always sometimes some of the things that people do. I loved what Romaine said. He'd say, you know, we were going to, you know, I talked to the Lord, you know, and, 
you know, he had a Thursday study, you know, or something, you know, and he'd go, well, I talked to the Lord on Sunday, you know, and Chuck was talking about this, you know, and I, I was really enthused about this, you know, so I prayed about it, you know, and then I got out my Bible, you know, and I was reading on, on, you know, Corinthians, you know, and, and it was Corinthians 13, I was going to teach on that, you know, and then, then, you know, Tuesday came along, and I said, you know, I'm not going to teach on Tuesday, you know, I'm going to change over to Revelation, I'm going to look at Revelation, and he started getting his notes for that, he had his notes all set and placed in, Wednesday comes along, he says, you know, I was going to do that, you know, he says, you know, and then the Lord, you know, I got up this morning, and the Lord said, no, I don't want you to use any of those, so open your book to James. <laughs> That was Romaine. <laughs> he said, God didn't want me to teach from those. He wanted me to roam James today. You know, like, okay. And that was my thing. You know, it's like I was trained that way. Whatever God wants you to say, he'll tell you. Right when you need to say it. And sure enough, it sounds professional. You know, it rolls right out. You know, praise the Lord. Because by way of daily being in the Word, the word will daily come out of you. You know, it's just that way. You fill your heart full of the word of God. Your life comes out as the word of God, living it through the experiences of seeing the circumstances fit into the living word as the Holy Spirit makes it applicable to your life. So the ministry that you're called to is God leading you, and is He your Lord? Because if He's not, then what you're doing is wasting your time and his, because except the Lord build a house, the labor laboreth in vain. And except the watchmen watched in the night, you know, the city sleeps foolishly. <laughs> I think that's the way it goes. I can't remember it exactly right now. It's kind of like, I'm, wow, I didn't remember that extra part. But I would say, whenever you're looking to repackage something, don't. Whenever you're trying to change things to make it more palatable to people, don't. Whenever you're trying to find a niche for yourself to fit in with other people, don't. God made you the way you are. God made the Word the way it is. He wants you to take what it is, the way it is, where it is, as it is, the way you are, where you are, the way you are, as you are, and put the two together and make you into the ministry of God.